take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading, Ezekiel chapter 22, please. Ezekiel and chapter 22, please. Ezekiel 22, and we're going to read verses 24 through 30. Verses 24 through 30 of Ezekiel 22, reading the verses responsibly as we normally do, beginning together on verse number 24 and alternating till we end together on verse 30, Ezekiel 22. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 24 of Ezekiel 22. Ready? Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring, roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them, that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the Scripture here this evening. I want to thank you, Lord, for the Word of God, and thank you for the wonderful privilege that's ours to hold copies of it in our hands tonight. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would be ready to give the Word of God our undivided attention. Lord, we desire that you speak to our hearts, and you have in these last days... Uh, spoken to us through your word and Lord I pray that each of us would be open to what the spirit would say to his church this evening so turn our hearts into your hearts Lord and uh, allow us to understand and to comprehend the truth that you have for us this evening bless the special now we ask in Jesus name amen
Father in heaven, now we bow before you in prayer as we come to open up your inspired word tonight. I want to ask you, God, you would help us as we look into your word. Open our understanding tonight, God, that we would grasp the truth that you have for us this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help me as I bring the message and help each one as they listen, that your will would be accomplished in each one of our hearts and lives. We commit these, this time to you and ask you to use it as only you can in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Back to the book of Ezekiel there where we read this evening. You find that Israel uh, had a problem. Uh, the priests and God deals with it here uh, in chapter 22, uh, actually throughout the book. And you realize in Ezekiel, they already, much of Israel has been carried away captive into Babylon. A judgment has already begun. And God is telling them uh, what the problem is and what, what some of the difficulty has been in Israel. And he talks about the conspiracy in verse number 25 of the prophets. He talks about the priests in verse 26. And he said, they violated my law. Notice it says, they've profaned my holy things. Now the priests were the ones who went to God on behalf of the people. Uh, they would present offerings and sacrifices to God uh, for the sins of the people. And he says those, those priests, those who are going to God on behalf of the people, they're putting no difference between things that are holy and things that are profane. Now, holy, it means things that are set apart. Uh, when God, there were certain things in the temple that God had, they were set apart only for the temple. Uh, if there's a laver uh, in the temple that they would use, you didn't. The, the priest didn't. The, the priest didn't say, "Well, we've misplaced our laver at home. I'll just take this home and we'll use this laver for our gravy tonight." All right, you didn't do that. That laver was holy, set apart, only for the use in the temple, for God to use. It was holy. All right. And so, set apart for God's service, pure and holy. By the way, the Bible says, once we're saved, we are to be holy. What does that mean? Set apart for God to use. Set apart for God's service. Separate from the common. Separate from the world. Set apart unto God. We're, we're, not, just, we're not just separate from sin or separate from what's common. That doesn't make us holy. You can be separate from what's common. You can be separate from the world and just be weird. That's true. You have people, the, 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 how many remember a group named the Moonies? And the, you know, the Hare Krishnas and these type of people. They're, they're different than the world, but they're just weird. Okay? The, the whole part is not just to be separate from the world, but to be separate unto God. We are separated unto Him. That's where the holiness comes in. See, that's where we're, we're separated to God. All right? We're, that's where holiness comes into play. Profane means common. Okay? <clears throat> Two words, pro, meaning in favor of, are in front of, and fain, meaning temple. So it means they were put common things ahead of the temple, ahead of the things of God, putting common things ahead of holy things. When I take things God intended to be holy and make them common, that makes them profane. When I take God's name and I use it commonly, we call that profanity. 
See, I'm taking that which is supposed to be holy and making it a common thing and using it in common language. That's profanity. And God, God desires holiness for us. And as he, as he talks to the, uh, tells them about the priests and tells them about the prophets and tells them about the princes and all that they were doing, verse 30 says, I looked for a man. He said, I sought for a man that could make up the hedge, that could stand in the gap, but tragically, he couldn't find one. I found none. And not a man, listen, not a man that could stand for God. He did, God didn't need the man. The land needed the man. The land, God says, it would stand in the gap for me not to have to judge the land, but I couldn't find anybody. What benefits our land is when God's people, God's men, God's women live holy lives before God. That benefits our land. If we live in a day like Ezekiel did and like Isaiah did, where God says you live in a day when people are calling evil good and good evil. And boy, we're there. We have a, we, we have a country where good things are trying to be done and people are getting all upset and all out of, out of sorts. And, and you think, what are they so upset about? These are good things. But they think they're evil things. And good is being called evil and evil is being called good. We are exactly where they were in Israel. But I want to go back to the, the, the issue. Listen, the issue isn't in politics. The issue isn't in the White House. The issue is in the church house. It's still the same, same problem that they had is that we have. We do not make a difference between the holy and the profane. Between things that are holy and things that are common. Now I want to point out several things tonight that God says are to be holy. Number one, God's name is to be holy. God's name is to be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I am holy. The Bible says there's creatures that stand before the throne of God, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continually, all they do is cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty constantly, over and over and over again. God is holy. When Israel would turn to idolatry, what's the big problem God has with that? How many times in the Old Testament do you read, I am the Lord thy God, and besides me there is none else. And how many times would God say, besides me, there's no one like me. There's no one like God. That's why He said you'll have no other gods before God. Me. Because I, God says, I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm above all other gods. There's no God like me. And there is no God like God. He's the King of kings and He's the Lord of lords. He's the one of a kind God. I think you heard a little bit about that Wednesday night. That's why it was such a sin of Lucifer in Isaiah 14 to say, I will be like you. Nobody can be like God. Nobody can take the place of God. Nobody can come close to being like God. He, there's no one like God. And nobody is great or awesome as Him. He replaced, Lucifer would replace God's will with His will. And when he did that, God made a devil out of him. God cursed him to the ground. And by the way, be careful. Be careful when you want to place your will for God's will. You can be just like Lucifer was. When we say, well, I, I know what the Bible says, but I think, or do you really want to put your thoughts on the same level as God's Word? See, do we really want to go there? Do we really want to say, well, I know the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the omnipotent God, the only God, the Creator God, the God that there is none like Him in all the earth. I know what He says, but let me tell you what I think. Really? Does that really matter? No. God is holy. God is holy. And our will is not more important than His will. Our thoughts are not more important than His thoughts. There's none like God. He's set apart from all other gods. All right? Number two, God's name is holy. God's name is holy. In Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah chapter 57 and verse number 15, 
the Bible says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. I dwell with the with I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. He says, my name is holy. That's why it's wicked to use God's name like any other word. That's why, that's why a Christian ought not to say OMG. Christians should not say that, should not put that in social media. I don't... I don't think a Christian ought to be caught saying, oh my gosh. I think so often that, that G-O-S-H can sound a lot like G-O-D. It's just real close. And sometimes I've heard people say, and I'd have to look at them and say, what did you say? Say, oh no, no, I didn't say that. But it sure sounded like that. And his name is holy. That's why it's called profanity. It's holy. It's pure. It's unique. The Old Testament scribes, when they would pen the Word of God, they would wash their hands, get a new pen, write God's name, put the pen away, never to be used again. Sometimes they would get up and go through that process. Some of them would even change their clothes. They would do that sometimes as many as six times in one verse. That's how much respect and reverence they had for the name of God. How holy He was. We've come a long way from that. Isaiah says his name is holy. We should not use it like other names. It's it's the same with the name of Jesus. What did the New Testament tell us? That name is a name that is above all names. That name is above all names. Be, Be careful how you use the name Jesus. We... God is holy, His name is holy. God's day is to be holy. Notice with me Isaiah 58. In Isaiah 58, in verse number 13, the Bible says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And we're not talking about observing the Sabbath day. Okay? We do not observe the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is Saturday. It's the sixth day of the week, or the seventh day of the week. We are all now on the first day of the week. We're on Sunday. The week starts today. Your week doesn't start tomorrow. Your week started today. The first day of the week is the Lord's Day. Paul wrote the church of Corinth, and he said upon the first day of the week when you gather together, he talked about bringing the offering with you. And you gather together on the first day of the week. When the disciples met after the resurrection of Christ, they met on the first day of the week. And, and they met to, I think, celebrate and commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So it's not the Sabbath anymore for us, it's the Lord's Day, and we're certainly not under uh, the Sabbath restrictions, and every day is a day that is for God. A Christian doesn't live, we don't live, we don't have Sunday religion. We don't have Sunday Christianity, okay? We have everyday Christianity. We live for God every single day uh, of the week, but there ought to be There ought to be a uniqueness. There ought to be a specialness about the Lord's Day. There ought to be something special about Sunday. In America, we have now profaned the Lord's Day. Like it or not, we've profaned it. What does it mean? We've made it another common day. We've just made it another day of the week. One week from tonight, there'll be... There'll be numbers of Christians who will not go to church. There'll be numbers of churches that will not have services because the world is having a football game next Sunday night. And, and, and we, we've, we've made it such a common thing just to cancel church and, and not have it. That's no big deal. Well, I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal to God. Uh, our country, in the not-too-distant future, in not-too-distant history of our country, things weren't that way. I remember as a kid growing up when if, if you didn't have it, if you, if you needed something on Sunday, too bad, you're waiting until Monday to get it. 
There was not a store you could buy it at. You didn't, you didn't go out to eat on Sunday. There was nobody open. Everybody ate a meal at home on Sunday. And I grew up that way. And Sunday was, you, you had church, you had a meal, and then in our, in our family, they, they, either somebody came to our house and visited or we went somewhere else and visited, but that's what you did on Sunday. And, and get this, growing up, you, you, church, church would be out at 12 or 12.30, you'd have dinner. You know what time Sunday night church was? 7.30. 7.30 Sunday night. So you had, you had seven hours Sunday afternoon. That's why you could eat, go visit, take a nap, you know, do all kinds of things and, and go back to church Sunday night. I mean, it was the Lord's day. I remember I remember first time I knew anything different than 7.30 was I went to Bible college. I got to Bible college and, and I heard a, a, one church was having a 5 o'clock Sunday night service. Oh, that's a liberal church there, man. <laughs> You can't have church at 5 o'clock. That's liberal. And uh, we've, it's just creeping up. But the problem you have is then you have people who begin to say you don't even need a Sunday night service. In fact, you know, by and large, outside of independent Baptist and Southern Baptist and maybe some assemblies of God, there are not many that have Sunday night church anymore. There's, there's just not many. Folks are just, just, just passing it by. You know why? Because it's become a common thing. I told you, uh, it, it, it grieves my heart what I'm seeing across our country. And what I'm seeing is you're, you're seeing that these sports leagues that they're, they're trying to get the, the young families to get their children involved in. You know when they want to play their, when they're playing their games now? Sunday. And you'll see, you'll see hundreds of young families with Third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, young families, they're not in church on Sunday. They're at the gymnasium. They're on the ball field outside. They're, they're, they're involved in athletics instead of being involved in church. What is that? We've made common that which is supposed to be holy. Used to be, used to be sacred. You didn't, you didn't have those games on Sunday. You didn't do those kind of things on Sunday. It wasn't that way, not that long ago in our country. So, let's, listen, let's keep Sunday the Lord's day. If, if I gave you, if, if you give me $6, and you keep, you keep one for yourself, and you go home, and tonight I come to your house, break in and steal your dollar, what do you think of me? Say, what is wrong with you, man? I gave you six. You still want my one, two? Now, wait a minute. God gives us seven days. And he says, I'd like one to be the Lord's day. To you be in my house. To you be in my service. To you uh, uh, come and worship me and be with God's people and, and hear the word of God and sing the songs of God and, 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 and serve me. And we said, well, God, yeah, but I, 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 I got the other six, but I want that one too. People do it all the time. You, do, you know it. You invite people to church. They had all kinds of things to do on Sunday besides come to church. Huh? Other guy says, well, I work six days a week. Sunday's my day. Huh? Well, who gave you those other six? God did. And by the way, what's wrong with saying my day can be God's day? I'll go, I'll go to church. Hmm? Nothing wrong with that. God's day is to be holy. Boy, we get back to that. We'd be doing a great thing for our country. Set apart for him. His day belongs to him. Not to us to do. Notice what he said. It's the, the problem he had with Israel was they took the Sabbath and made it profane. What do you mean? He said, you're going to do your own ways. You're going to find your own pleasure. You're going to speak your own words. You're just doing what you want to do. You've made it just like any other day. It matters not. So God is holy. God's name is holy. God's day is holy. We know this. Number four, God's spirit is holy. In fact, he's called the Holy Spirit, is he not? And he says he's the, the one that he'll, he'll send. And when Jesus says, I'm going to send him to you when I go. And notice John chapter 16. Let's look at the gospel of John chapter 16. I want you to see these verses. John 16. Notice with me, if you will, verse 13. 
Jesus says, How be it, John 16, 13, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. So He says the Spirit's coming, and He's not going to talk about Himself. So if someone's always talking about the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the Spirit did this, the Spirit said that, uh, that's not the Holy Spirit. What will the Spirit talk about? Look at verse 14. He shall glorify me. Who's me? Jesus Christ. He shall glorify me. He'll receive mine and show it unto you. He's going to glory. When you bring glory to someone, you put them in the spotlight. You put all the light on them. He says when the Holy Spirit's present, all the spotlight will be on Jesus Christ. It will not be on the Spirit. It'll be on Jesus he will glorify me. He doesn't promote himself. He promotes Jesus Christ. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to preach the gospel. He empowers us to live the Christian life. He's the comforter. He's the one who regenerates us at salvation. We're, we're born again by the Spirit of God. The Spirit moves where he, he desires, where He listeth. And so He regenerates us. He indwells us. He's to control us, as we talked about in our Sunday school class this morning. He's to be in control. We're to be under His influence in our life. That's how we can live the way that God says we ought to live. Otherwise, we all fail miserably. We have to do it under His power and under His control. He's not given for miracles. He's not given for miracles. Is this on? He's not given for miracles. Given for... To, to take, to take the, the fullness of the Spirit of Pentecost, where, the, where they were empowered, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, 3,000 people received Christ and were baptized and added to the church. And to take that and say, what I really want is I want to speak in languages. I want to speak in another language. And miss the fact I want to preach the gospel where 3,000 people can get saved and baptized. You know, it's like, it's like me getting a million dollars in a paper sack and giving it to Alan, and Alan, Alan takes the paper sack, dumps the money out, and keeps the paper sack. You say, Alan, what's wrong with you, man? Huh? That's what it is when people say, I want the tongues, and I don't want all the, the power that got the people saved and saw them get baptized. Keep the, keep the main thing the main thing. So God's God is holy, God's name is holy, God's day is holy, God's spirit is holy, God's word is holy. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, we know verse 16 about all scriptures given given inspiration of God. Verse 15 said <clears throat> that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Holy scriptures. You know why? You cannot treat the Bible like any other book. It's a holy book. It's set apart. It's for God. It's God-breathed. You, you don't have any other book at home like that book right there. You don't have any other book on your shelf. You have no other book in your house that God gave like that book. There's no other book like it. It's God-breathed. These are the words of God. It's unique. It's one of a kind. There's none other like it. And, and so treat it like that. We don't, we don't respect it like that. We don't, we don't give it the honor that we ought to. If we take what is perfect and mess with it, all we're going to do is make it imperfect. God made it perfect. If God is it, did God did if God's perfect, his word must be perfect. So if man messes with it, we're going to make it imperfect. And if it's already perfect, why do we need to mess with it? Good question. If it's already perfect, then we, don't, we can't do anything to improve on it. How do you improve perfect? You can't. You can't improve perfect. Now God talked about His ministers here as prophets. And He said that they're deceiving in Exodus 22. They're lying to the people. They're, they're, they're daubed them with 
untempered mortar. It said they're seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. There was thus saith the Lord God when the Lord hath not spoken. Verse number 28. God is talking about the deceitfulness of the preachers. He's just saying they're, 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 they're lying. They're saying I said things when I didn't say them. And boy, we're there. We're there where people come and they're, they're, they're getting psychology from God's Word. They're getting uh, things that, that, that are not true and being told they're true. God's not concerned about what's going on in your life just so long as you sow this seed money. God's not so concerned as uh, what's that, what, what kind of... He accepts whatever lifestyle you have. We, we, we get all kinds of things that are being said and, and stated in the name of God that, that, that is trying to, uh, under the name of pragmatism, and pragmatism simply means the end justifies the means. In other words, if it works, if I get a crowd, then that's okay, it's all right to do it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Thus saith the Lord. And what does God say? We haven't taught the difference between the holy and the profane. We haven't taught the difference between what is holy and what is common. What is clean and what is unclean. They didn't teach. They didn't teach the people what's right and acceptable before God and what is not right and what is not acceptable before God. You get the idea that, well, God ought to just be happy I'm here. God ought to just be happy that He has me. Well, that may be right in your mind, but that's not right in God's mind. You've been bought with a price. Try that. Go to work tomorrow and don't do anything. And when your manager or your boss comes, you just say, well, I just thought you'd be glad I'm here. Huh? Yeah, you, you, won't, you won't have a job very long. No, you're there. They expect certain things of you. Well, I got news for you. God expects certain things of us. And He deserves that for what He's done for us and for what He has given to us. There's things that are right and acceptable in the sight of God and things that we think are extremely right in our eyes can be extremely wrong in God's eyes. We may not see things the way God sees things. And so we have to teach and preach God's Word because, listen, our morality can be flawed, our thoughts can be flawed, our, our view can be flawed, but God's word's always right. And we have to make sure we, we judge by God's word. So God is holy. God's name is holy. God's day is holy. God's spirit's holy. God's word is holy. God's tithe is holy. In Leviticus 27 and verse number 30, the Bible says, The tithe is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. The tithe is holy. In other words, that's separated. Separate to the Lord. When you, when you take what is to be separated to God and you spend it on McDonald's or you spend it on a new suit or new clothing or a set of, you know, it's anything you want to name. You know what you just did? You profaned the tithe. That's set apart. For God. That's set apart. And there's nowhere, listen, when God said that the tithe is holy to Him, set apart to Him, there's nowhere in the Bible where He took that back and said, that's only for a certain time period and then it's no longer in, in use. Once God says it's holy, it's holy. Once He said it's set apart to Him, it's set apart to Him. And I, I'm not to take that which is holy and use it for something common. The promise is that I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then what? All these things will be added unto me. And what are those things were? What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? Where am I going to wear? Where am I going to... Your food, your clothing, your shelter. God says, I'm able to take care of those things. You seek first the kingdom of God. The tithe is holy. God is holy, God's name's holy, God's day is holy, God's spirit's holy, God's word is holy, God's tithe is holy. All right, hold on. God's music is to be holy. 
God's music is to be holy. In Ephesians 5, look there with me, will you? Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Are you all right? I only got 17 more holy things. but well, No, I don't have that many really. But Ephesians 5. We spent some time in Ephesians this morning in Sunday school. The Bible says in verse 18, you're familiar with this verse, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. Now, filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, what will happen? Speaking, by the way, is there a period at the end of verse 18? No, there's a colon, a semicolon. So the sentence, the thought is still not done. So what is going to be the result of being filled with the Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, period. Okay? All of that goes together. Speaking to yourselves, psalms or the scriptures put the music. Some of you have heard psalms put the music and you sing some of the psalms. Hymns are anthems or songs that are meant to praise and glorify God. That's what a hymn is. Brings glory to God. A spiritual song are songs of testimony to the goodness of God. All right? Um, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. That's a spiritual song. You're testifying of the goodness of God to you. I think, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. That's a hymn. See, that's the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the power of God. Okay? And, and God says we're going to be singing to ourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Don't separate the music from the Spirit of God. And what kind of spirit is the Spirit of God? Holy Spirit. Holy means set apart. Set apart. It's not common. Not the normal that you hear that's associated with everything else. You don't, by the way, that's what makes music holy or unholy. Holy are profane. By, by profane, I don't mean it's sinful, but I do mean it's common. There ought to be a distinct, there is a distinctive sound to holy music, to Christian music. Nobody's ever come in the doors of this church and got to an in sound of the auditorium or sound of the music and said, wow, they got a rock concert going on? Never been mistaken for that. Never wondered uh, what kind of music are they playing. Never had to get confused about that. There's, there, 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 we're, we're putting a difference between the holy and the profane. The holy and the common. Music is associated with the Spirit of God. That's what makes the music holy. You don't yoke God's message with the common music of the world. You see, what the church has made the mistake is we've taken the, 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 the music of the world, the common and saying, hey, let's put Christ's message with this and bring it before the Lord. And God says, that's an unequal yoke. You see, if the message is holy, and we've determined the message is holy, then that which carries the message must be holy as well. They both have to be holy. Many are practicing profanity today. And they're not cussing. It's in the music they listen to. Boy, that's quiet. Hmm? Should I pull over and park there a while? <laughs> Step on some toes there. Think about it. Holy, profane. See, we... Let, let, let me, I'll, I'll include that in this, in this next point. And, I, and I'll tell you, it's not just the next point, it's the last point, all right? So that'll encourage some of you. I won't, 
I won't tell you it's the longest point, but it's the last point. No, it isn't. But God's temple is to be holy. Now we know in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, that who's the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are. Now it's not a building. It's, it's us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are God's temple. The temple, when Solomon dedicated the temple, do you remember that in 1 Kings? When he dedicated the temple, do you remember what happened after he prayed and dedicated the temple? The glory of the Lord fell on that temple. Descended on that temple. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. The glory of God is supposed to settle on our temple. People are supposed to see God glorified in our life. In our life. And they're supposed to see that as visibly sought on the temple. And so that temple was unique, set apart for God and set apart for God's service. So our temple is to be set apart for God and for God's service. My life is to be different from someone who does not know Christ. My life is to be different from someone who does not know Jesus Christ. And so is yours. See, the, the priests had mixed the holy things with the unholy things due to their lack of discernment. In fact, look, look again in Ezekiel 22. Would you get there real quick? I want to show you something. What God ended up saying to them. Verse 26 again. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. If you're there, you say amen. <clears throat> Notice he says, Her priests have violated my law, profaned my holy things, they put no difference between the holy and profane. No, they have showed, they have, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. They've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And, now watch the last phrase, I am profaned among them. They've even profaned me. The holy God, His, His uniqueness, holiness of character, was made to appear common, unholy. We were there. You know, we, we're in a day when we think that anything, anything that somebody wants to do for God will be a benefit to His kingdom. And that's not necessarily true. Nadab and Abihu went in and thought they could offer whatever kind of fire they wanted to, but to God. How'd that work out? <laughs> God toasted them. God judged them very... See, we, again, we don't understand. You ever had somebody say, why would God kill somebody for picking up sticks on a Sabbath day? Because it was holy. We don't understand holiness. We don't understand how serious God takes it. And God says, this is important stuff. This is big. And He says, I want you to be holy and don't profane Me. And He lives in us. So we think that we can bring anything. In fact, the, the world's ways of promotion or advertising or entertaining are brought into the church. And I've looked recently at some church services that you, you could, I, I could take some rock concerts from 25, 30 years ago and put them side by side and you would not tell a difference. You'd have a hard time telling which was which. That's how bad we've come. That's how far we've come. When we get the idea. You know, I, I just wonder, what's the, what's the impression that people get in the world when they drive by a church? In fact, most, most modern churches now that get built, they don't even want it to look like a church. There's a large church down in Texas that you walk in and you will not find a cross anywhere in the church. There's a large church in Illinois where they've written books and had conferences. You will not find a cross in the church anywhere. 
You know why? That may offend someone who comes to church. Paul said, that's a long way from if I glory, I'll glory in the cross. It's a long way, isn't it? No mention of sin. No mention of, of anything that, that, that might know. Certainly no mention of hell. Our judgment on sin. And a holy God is made to appear quite common. Very much part of the world system. Very human in His ways. I wonder what they think. I wonder what the world senses when they walk into a meeting like that. I wonder, do they ever walk in and sense the power of God in a place? Do they ever walk in or, or do they just sense the energy? The band really gets me going. Boy, that's just, that's just a, I get fired up. You know, I was thinking about Nehemiah. In his time, they, we talked about Sanballat and Tobiah. When you read later on in Nehemiah, things got so bad. Once they got the walls built and they began to have the temple getting put together and things back in the temple, they actually gave Tobiah, the Ammonite, a room in the temple. Unbelievable. Nehemiah was not aware of that. He'd been gone and when he came back, he found out about it. Some of you are smiling. You know the story. He, he served the eviction notice personally on Tobiah. And he threw him out and all of his belongings out and cleansed the temple. He did not have any place for him at all. And I think there's some cleansing that needs to take place in our churches today. I believe it applies to this hour, that, that, that verse 26, or verse 26 of Ezekiel 22. Listen, listen, look here and we'll be done. God judged Israel because the, the, His people were putting no difference between the common, the profane, and the holy. I think if, if God will spare America, I think the churches have to get back to making a difference between the holy and the profane. The holy and the common. There's nothing wrong with going to church and feel like you went to church. Nothing wrong with leaving church and saying, man, I was in church today. And that's okay. It felt like church. We sang the songs of God and we heard the people of God and we listened to the word of God and it was a wonderful day in church. Let's Let's make sure we keep the dividing line between the holy and the profane. One more scripture I want you to look at and we'll be done. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Would you look there please? Notice with me verse 20 where Paul writes Timothy and says, Now Timothy, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. What's sanctified mean? Set apart means holy. Okay? I want to be a vessel unto honor that is sanctified, holy. It's meat for the Master's use and prepared for every good work. Don't you want to be that vessel? Don't you like to be one that is meat for the Master's use and prepared for every good work? That's what we need. I think that's what God desires. I think that would be the man that would stand in the gap and make up the hedge for the land, for God. Listen, the answer for America isn't on Pennsylvania Avenue tonight. 
some of us, some, some in the room, obviously we're, we're thankful for the, for the administration that's there over what has been there. But that's not the answer. It never has been. The answer is always in the church house, not in the White House. The greatness of America is never in the White House. The greatness of America is in the church house. We need to get back to making a difference between the holy and the profane. But that starts with each of us individually. Asking God to make us a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the Master's use, and prepared to every good work. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, thank you for the plainness of your word, and oh, how holy you are. Forgive us, God, for the many times we fail to understand, we fail to grasp, your holiness, and how important that is, how vital that is. And oftentimes we just make it such a common thing. We do it without even thinking. Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us as individuals and help us as a church to always make a difference between the holy and the profane may realize there are things that are set apart for God. They're holy. And we never use them in a common way. And help us to live holy because you are holy and you live in us. May we show this world what a Christian truly is. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I just tonight wonder how many of you would say, Preacher, I, God, spoke, God has spoken to my heart tonight. I realize the holiness of God, the holiness of His Word, holiness of His name, holiness of the Lord's Day. But I, I'm not sure what it is that God has dealt with your heart about, and maybe it's just that you want to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, Meet for the master to use. Prepared for every good work that he'd have for you. If God has spoke to your heart tonight, just say, Pastor, pray for me this evening. The Spirit of God spoke to me. Will you slip your hand up? Pray for me tonight, Pastor. God bless you. Amen. Wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. Respond to what God has told you to do. Bow the knee. Yield yourself as a vessel. That you'd be sanctified, set apart for God to use in any way he sees fit. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done and what you are going to do in each one of our lives. God, please have your way in every heart and life now these next few moments. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist plays. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Take my life and let it That's be right. consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of my love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not a might would I withhold. Not a might would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour. At thy feet it's treasure store.
take myself and I will be ever only all for thee ever only all for thee Our Father we bow before you in prayer now thank you Lord for a good day today in the house of God thank you Lord for a good start to the month of January and to this year of 2017 Lord, we're praying tonight for those who are unable to be with us. They've been sick, Lord. There's so much flu and respiratory things going around. And I pray, God, that you would heal them, uh, help them to be better by Wednesday so they could be with us in the midweek service. Protect those of us who are here, Lord, and, and help help us prevent from getting sick and uh, for it coming upon us. And, uh, Lord, I pray that your hand will be upon every individual as we leave this place tonight. Lord, may we live lives that please you and are honoring to you. Lord, thank you for your love for us. We sure love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. And thank you again for a wonderful Lord's Day. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing that together. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.